ships. The gigantic guns can hurl deadly projectiles the weight of an automobile against targets more than 20 miles away. They are still among the fastest, largest, and most powerful warships ever to sail the world's oceans. Deep inside the armored hull, men program critical data into a sophisticated central nervous system. Its origins date to the last century. At their command, the guns fire with fearful accuracy. For 100 years, proud symbols of the world's mightiest nations. Great fighting machines that had no equal. Home to that special breed of fighting man, the battleship sailor. Victors and victims in the war at sea. On their decks have unfolded many a turning point in the history of the 20th century. The battleship long thought unsinkable, indestructible. Until the morning of December 7, 1941, when at Pearl Harbor, her mastery of the sea seemed over, eclipsed by the terrible power and accuracy of carrier-based aircraft. Yet she reappears in Korea and Vietnam. And 50 years after the premature report of her death at Pearl Harbor, her weapons echo across the waters of the Persian Gulf. Once again, the battleship is back. This is her story. The 2nd of August, 1990. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait has been met with a swift response. A coalition of Western and Arab nations has created a massive buildup of armament in Saudi Arabia. President George Bush issues a final ultimatum to the Iraqi president. Withdraw from Kuwait or face overwhelming force. As 1991 begins, the United States adds the final weapons to the coalition's arsenal. Two of America's aging battleships will answer the call. For months, the USS Missouri has been making preparations for her third war. Her firepower has been modernized as she prepares to join her sister, the battleship Wisconsin, already in the Gulf. 16 January, Iraq ignores the coalition's ultimatum. 17 January, 1.40 a.m., the crew of the Missouri is at general quarters. Missouri Captain Lee Case. The Tomahawks, of course, were the first ones launched in the war. And this was the first time that the battleship Missouri entered the modern age with modern weapons. We had never had the opportunity to fire those before, and every one of them worked as advertised. And the Missouri's basic armament, her 50-year-old 16-inch guns, were fired in anger for the first time since the Korean War. The target was the port city of Kafchi, Saudi Arabia. To get within range, the Missouri moved into the shallows. There were only three feet of water beneath her keel. Leak case. Well, when the big guns were fired in anger for the first time during the Gulf War, a cheer could be heard from one end of the ship to the other. Uh, you could hear over the sound-powered phones the excitement of all the people in the plotting rooms. Uh, the turret that got to fire the first round, I think, was probably the uh, big heroes of the day at that particular time. Later, when the ground war to recapture Kuwait began, the Missouri pounded away with her big guns to support the soldiers and Marines ashore. She fired one 16-inch round every 15 seconds, nine guns firing in rotation, reloaded in under one minute per barrel. In just two hours, the Missouri had fired 133 rounds. Not bad for an aging lady.
But one of the Missouri's most effective new weapons never fired a shot. The RPVs, or remotely piloted vehicles, were the Missouri's own spotters, like the battleship float planes of old. The miniature aircraft featured two camera systems, one for day, the other infrared for night viewing, when they could be most effective. The RPVs were 14 feet long, their wingspan 17 feet. Their computerized controls were operated by a pilot inside the battleship's superstructure. Rocket launched to an altitude of 200 feet in less than two seconds, the plane's two-cycle engine then took over. Over the enemy target, the RPV sends pictures and coordinates back to the ship. The pictures are fed into the closed-circuit TV system. An Iraqi food truck stops at a series of bunkers along a road. It is spotted by the cameras of the unheard RPV 1,500 feet above. The positions are fed into the Missouri's computer, and when the big guns fire, they are precisely on target. Proof positive that the 50-year-old big guns can still do their work. For Lee Case, the RPV was the perfect airborne spotter. So there was a perfect blend of the old and new on board Missouri in the Gulf War, and both the old and the new contributed to our success. The USS Missouri fights on. America's most historic battleship, the newest technology now grafted to her aging body. Like her battleship sisters, she was born to another time, another place. Far from the Persian Gulf, off the Hawaiian island of Oahu, is the watery graveyard of another great battleship. The remains of some 900 American sailors and marines still lie within her twisted wreck. The battleship Arizona rests quietly below the peaceful waters of Pearl Harbor. Oil still escapes from her tanks. This was once a living ship, forever doomed on the morning of December 7, 1941. Dick Fisk was the bugler on the USS West Virginia. I sounded first call around five minutes to eight for colors. We were looking towards the Arizona and then towards the two mountains there, and then we saw a group of airplanes coming in. We thought that they were ours. Dan Martinez is an historian at the Arizona Memorial. On the morning of December 7, 1941, his grandfather was finishing his night shift. He was walking to his car when the first torpedo planes roared right overhead about 150 feet in altitude. At first he thought it was just a mock battle or drill. It was no drill. At 7.55 that Sunday morning, the clock began to tick away the final minutes of the battleship era. The great warships were all there, awaiting Admiral's inspection. For the skilled Japanese pilots who had long practiced for this secret mission, the American battleships moored so tightly in a row were a textbook target to which they brought new and terrible weapons of war. The development of a shallow water torpedo was essential to the success of the attack. The Japanese knew that Pearl Harbor was only 45 feet deep. American commanders felt secure in Pearl Harbor. They were sure torpedoes required a depth of 100 feet before they could be effective. But they were wrong. We just took torpedo after torpedo, and come to find out we, we had actually nine torpedoes in us. Equally destructive was the armor-piercing bomb dropped from an altitude of 10,000 feet. 
The point of this bomb, with its delayed action fuse, was meant to penetrate inside the ship, then explode. We were looking towards the Arizona when this, this, this whistle come by, it sounded like a freight train, and it landed just forward of the number one gun turret. I thought that the, the battleship was most invincible. Nothing could hurt it. 16 inches of armor plating? Ain't nothing gonna go through that. The Arizona foundered in nine minutes and burned for two and a half days. One thousand one hundred and seventy-seven men lost their lives on the battleship Arizona that morning. With the death of the Arizona, it seemed, died the battleship itself. For half a century, the universal symbol of naval pride and power, the Americans were stunned by the daring of the Japanese. I think there was an arrogance on the part of America to understand that the Japanese were capable of these things. Mostly when you read newspapers or magazines of the period, you got the impression that the Japanese were inferior. Japanese planning was anything but inferior. They had set a secret route across the treacherous northern Pacific and had sent the liner Tayumaru in advance to be certain no one sailed up there. In a bold effort, they raced toward Pearl Harbor, knowing that they could succeed. I thought we had the most powerful Navy in the world. What happened? The sunken Arizona was thought by many to symbolize the end of an era. Today, there are no battleships on Battleship Row. Only the symbols and memories of those once great warships and of the war itself linger on. The Japanese had been planning their attack for over a year. Their war plan had been secretly but actively in operation since the fall of 1941. It included the conquest of Guam, Wake Island, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Malaya. It began with their surprise attack on the Americans. On December 8, just one day after the fateful and tragic attack at Pearl Harbor at the British Admiralty in London, the leadership of the Royal Navy met to debate the future deployment of its two warships, Prince of Wales and Repulse, Winston Churchill's personal choice to protect the far-flung reaches of the British Empire. It was the Prince of Wales that just four months earlier carried Churchill across the Atlantic for his historic face-to-face -face meeting with the American president. Symbolically, under the guns of the British battleship, they had signed the Atlantic Charter. Now in the Pacific, the Prince of Wales and Repulse are the lone symbols of Britain's resolve. The question, should these two now be rushed to Pearl Harbor? The debate continues throughout December 9. At day's end, they adjourn. The decision will be taken tomorrow, December 10, 1941. But off the coast of Malaya, it already is tomorrow. As Admiralty officials sleep in London, Repulse and Prince of Wales search the sea for a Japanese landing force and are spotted from the air. As at Pearl Harbor, 48 hours earlier, the combination of high-level bombers and low-flying torpedo planes is devastating. 
it will be the first time that aircraft will sink a battleship underway at sea. 840 British seamen lose their lives when the Prince of Wales and Repulse are both sunk. Those who had been debating the future of the two battleships awake to hear the terrible news. British naval historian Eric Grove. The Prince of Wales and Repulse was very much Churchill's own miscalculation. He thought that a small, fast squadron of capital ships based in Singapore would act as a very potent deterrent to a country that he thought of as effectively a bunch of rather crude yellow men who hadn't really grasped Western technology. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The loss of the Prince of Wales and the Repulse was a tremendous blow to British prestige, self-image, not just Britain itself, the entire empire. Reeling from the attack on Pearl Harbor and virtually alone in the Pacific, the United States strikes back. Her two Pearl Harbor-based aircraft carriers were at sea during the attack on December 7. By the spring of 1942, they had ravaged the Japanese fleet in the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway. At Midway alone, the Japanese lost four carriers and over 300 planes. Pearl Harbor had been avenged. In just six months, the tide of war had changed dramatically. On July 11, a battleship appears outside Pearl Harbor. She is the USS North Carolina, the first American battleship to be commissioned in 18 years. The largest, most modern of all American warships. It has taken nearly eight years to design and build her. The North Carolina would soon be in the thick of battle. But on this day, the majority of her crew lie in the decks to see the damage kept secret for seven months. Larry Rezin was a 17-year-old seaman aboard the North Carolina. I looked out and I saw these ships with their broken backs. I saw the Arizona still tilted over. The USS Oklahoma battleship, just the bottom showing oil all over the place. All of a sudden, there was this cheer from the men on the ships, from the shore, and I said to myself, we haven't done a thing, a damn thing, and they're cheering us. Ken Dews was at Pearl Harbor when the North Carolina came down the channel. What I saw there that day was the most magnificent man of war that any of us had ever seen. This ship meant that we had people, ships, and ammunition coming out of the states that were gonna be there in short order and they were gonna help us survive. The North Carolina would fight in every major campaign from Guadalcanal to the bombardment of Japan. She first saw action on 24 August, 1942 while protecting the carrier enterprise. was remarkable, since at the time she had none of the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns with which she would later be equipped. At one point, six dive bombers were driven off by her primitive 20 millimeter deck guns. And by day's end, she had shot down seven planes and assisted with seven more. 
the war progressed, the North Carolina bristled with anti-aircraft guns. In her lifetime, the North Carolina's guns served her well. She earned battle stars for 15 campaigns. Nine times she shelled enemy positions ashore. She sank a troop ship, destroyed at least 24 aircraft, and defended American carriers against scores of attacks. In 1942, the North Carolina was a symbol of America's new strength in the Pacific. She would soon be joined by six of the eight battleships the Japanese thought they had destroyed at Pearl Harbor. At Guadalcanal, the carriers Enterprise, Saratoga, and Wasp were joined by the North Carolina, Washington, and South Dakota. Roosevelt Flanard served aboard the North Carolina. August 7th, 8th and 9th, 1942. The North Carolina was a part of a task force that was invaded Guadalcanal. We began firing uh, before daybreak, and we fired several hours after we, we bombarded the island a while, then the planes came in for bombardment, we backed out. The American carrier-based aircraft made certain that the Japanese would not reinforce their positions on the island. So our role was to protect the carrier from any other carrier planes and other ships that were in the area. Our job in the magazine was to get powder and shells up to the gun. We were sealed in. We were three or four decks down in this magazine. We would have to really work hard when it was a air attack because uh, the five-inch guns were shooting bam, bam, bam real fast and we just had to get the part of that to them. The men shot up in the North Carolina and in other battleships during an air attack could track the Japanese planes coming closer and closer by listening to the guns. First the five-inch, then the more rapid 40 millimeter, and finally the deck mounted 20 millimeter as the planes that survived came within close range. Fall 1942, the battle for Guadalcanal wears on. The Japanese send one of their most powerful battleships, the Karishima, to bombard the American air base at Henderson Field. On the nights of 14 and 15 November, between Savo Island and Guadalcanal, the battleships Washington and South Dakota engage in a gun duel at point-blank range with the Japanese force. The South Dakota is severely damaged, and the four American destroyers accompanying the two battleships are disabled in 20 minutes. The destroyer Preston took several direct hits before she sank. Her combat cameraman, Robert Reed, was thrown into the water. For nearly three hours, he watched the action. It was a duel between the Washington and the Parisian. The Karishima was outgunned. Her 14 inches could not penetrate the Washington's steel armored belt. The 16 inches of the Washington did penetrate the 14 inch belt of the Karishima and spelled her doom. She apparently burned and exploded until she finally went down, according to the battle reports, around 3 a.m. or 3.30. Throughout 1943, the Allied offensive grows ever stronger. American technology and training overwhelm the enemy. In the fall, the Allies begin the Central Pacific Campaign, a march through the Japanese-held atolls north of the equator, only 750 miles from the enemy homeland. Part of the American effort will rest with a new class of battleships, the Iowa class. The Americans had long been wary of Japanese plans in the Pacific. When four years before Pearl Harbor, Japan began to build three large battleships, the United States increased the size of its battleships to 45,000 tons, their guns to 16 inches. The 
The result is a new class of battleship named for the first of their kind, the USS Iowa. More than five years in design and construction, the Iowa and the Missouri would be built in the New York Navy Yard, the New Jersey and Wisconsin in Philadelphia. Up to 10,000 people had a hand in the construction of each ship. The Missouri alone required three million man days of work. In recognition of the threat from enemy aircraft, the four Iowa-class ships had been designed with an emphasis on the protection of their turrets, machinery, and magazines against aerial bombs. The heaviest armor was more than six inches thick. Two huge belts along the sides were angled inboard to provide protection equal to 13.5 inches of steel. The plates that were locked together to make up the belts weighed 50 tons each. The huge crane was at its limit as it positioned them to be welded in place. Because all of the Iowas entered service late in the war, each was equipped with the newest technology, including surface and air search radar that could track enemy aircraft 100 miles away. Each of the three turrets on an Iowa-class ship contained three of the newest 16-inch guns, the most powerful guns ever mounted on a U.S. warship. With its improved range, an armor-piercing shell from one of the new 16-inch guns was said to be capable of penetrating 32 feet of reinforced concrete. The Iowas had the greatest anti-aircraft capability of any ship in World War II. Their secondary armament included 25-inch guns in 10 twin mounts and 130 smaller anti-aircraft guns. They were fast, and they could cruise great distances without refueling. Their top speed was 33 knots, the fastest battleships in the world. And their range at 12 knots was an incredible 18,000 miles. The new battleships were run by crews of over 2,000 men. The Iowa-class battleships would see action in the Pacific in the closing months of World War II. By 1944, in the Philippine Sea, the fast carrier's fighter planes, supported by the battleship's anti-aircraft fire, were destroying the heart of Japanese naval aviation. Now the Americans begin to feel the extent of Japan's desperation. Naval historian Paul Stilwell. In the autumn of 1944, as the Americans got into the Philippines, the Japanese were so desperate in their defensive stance that they inaugurated the Corps of Kamikazes, planes flown by men who were, in effect, human fire control systems for the bombs they carried. They were deliberately willing to sacrifice their lives because of the code of the warrior that said dying for the emperor was the highest honor. The Kamikaze's primary targets are the wooden decks of the American aircraft carriers. On 24 October, a force of 259 carrier-based American bombers and torpedo planes attacked four of Japan's largest battleships in the Savoyan Sea. The American pilots concentrate on Musashi as she falls behind the others. After nine hours of unrelenting punishment, the great Japanese man of war, ravaged by 20 torpedoes and 10 bombs, rolls over and sinks. Oil and debris from the Musashi still float on the water the next day when a Japanese fleet of four destroyers, a cruiser and two battleships steam through a narrow strait called Suragao. The Japanese are unaware that at the north end of the strait, the Americans have assembled eight cruisers, 26 destroyers, and six battleships. It is a textbook trap. Ed Snyder was at Suragao Strait. 
we had very good intelligence which indicated to us which way the forces had to come. This forced the Japanese forces carrying the amphibious attack led by some battleships to come up through a strait, a very narrow strait, so narrow that the battleships could not turn. They had to stay within the channel. Uh, I, as gunnery officer, was tracking the Japanese lead battleship uh, through the optics of the rangefinder, which in effect was a sight. I had it in the crosshairs, and I, it suddenly occurred to me that this, uh, uh, that the pagoda-like mast of this Japanese ship was absolutely filling the, uh, the optics. It, we were that close, and uh, as I recall uh, thinking, my God, that looks just like the pagoda mast of a Japanese battleship that I learned about in recognition class back at the Naval Academy. And then I thought, well, that's exactly what it is. And, uh, and it's shooting back at us. It was at Surigao Strait that battleships last used the classic formation of crossing the T. It was a geographical decision, not just so much as a tactical decision, because the Japanese had to come up through the narrow strait. Crossing the T is a maneuver invented over a century and a half ago. By coming across the enemy's bow, battleships could fire broadsides while the enemy could only fire their forward guns. At Surigao Strait, the Americans crossed the T on the Japanese. We saw these tracers going through the sky, and they were coming from our battleships and all converging on the Japanese battleships. The battleships that we uh, had backing us up, the Maryland, the California, uh, the West Virginia, the Pennsylvania, the Mississippi, and the Tennessee, what poetic justice that these ships that were sunk at Pearl Harbor are, are going to go into action against Japanese battleships. Admiral Yamamoto was wrong to think that he could destroy the American resolve. He was right when he said, I fear we have awakened a sleeping giant. We must remember that Surigao Strait was the last major surface action between battleships. It's probably the last surface action between any kinds of ships that did not involve aircraft. That night, the American battleships, assisted, I like to think, by the attacks of the destroyers, really annihilated the, the Japanese battleship force. Four months after the Battle of Surigao Strait, America's great battleships are called upon once again. This time, the assignment is the shelling of the Japanese-held island of Iwo Jima. One of the eight older battleships is the West Virginia, back from the grave of Pearl Harbor. Her bugler, Dick Fisk, had been transferred to the 5th Marine Division and had gone ashore as an assistant platoon leader. The big gun was firing their shells into Mount Surabaji. It was exhilarating because we said, boy, now we got some firepower behind us. We're not alone out here. They're going to wipe this place out. Larry Resin was aboard the North Carolina. When they fired the main battery, that's the 16-inch guns, where the projectiles are about as tall as I am. If they fire nine of them at once, two things happen. Once, the recoil actually slides the ship sideways in the water. That's a lot of movement. But the other thing, especially in my battle station, you get a sucking out of the air in your lungs. I mean, the vacuum created by the projectiles taking off creates a vacuum. In March of 1945, only the island of Okinawa stood between the Allies and the Japanese mainland. And Okinawa was fiercely defended. For the Americans and for the Japanese, the battle for Okinawa would be the most costly action of the Pacific War. 75,000 Japanese, 13,000 Americans, and 150,000 Okinawan civilians would be lost. America's battleships were there to prepare the way. The North Carolina and the other three ships of the Iowa class, Missouri, Wisconsin, and New Jersey, joined the older but still highly accurate New Mexico and Tennessee. The Allied landings began on Easter Sunday, 1 April, 1945. 
They were accompanied by massive bombardments from the battleships. With the defense of Okinawa, the Japanese unleashed Operation Tengo, the largest, most concentrated kamikaze campaign yet. As I'm looking through these binoculars, which are huge binoculars called the eyes on the signal bridge, and I'm looking at this plane coming down as I see the shells coming out forward all around them, and then all of a sudden, I look in the side of the cockpit and I see the pilot, I see his fixed eyes, and then all of a sudden the wings come off, the explosions occur, the engine evidently catches on fire, and the pilot, with blood ringing down his face, leans over and slumps, meaning he's dead. That the plane still keeps coming like a ballistic missile straight at you, straight down. Very fortunately, it missed us by about 100 yards. Operation Tengo was truly a massive suicide campaign. The Americans had never seen anything like it. Thousands of young pilots eager to die as human bombs, believing they were part of a divine win. Thousands of kamikaze planes were shot out of the sky by carrier-based fighters and anti-aircraft fire from the battleships. Still, there were others that found their mark. 33 American ships and 5,000 men were lost to kamikaze attacks during Operation Tengo. But perhaps the greatest kamikaze mission of all time involved not aircraft, but a battleship, the largest, most fearsome battleship ever built. Four years before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the design for a new and massive battleship was secretly being tank tested in Japan's Kure shipyard. She would be called Yamato, the oldest and most sacred name with which the Japanese referred to their island nation. And she would be the largest, most powerful battleship ever built. A huge roof covered the behemoth. When trains moved past the construction, attendants drew the curtains to cut off the view. Under a shroud of secrecy, the great ship took shape. Nearly 23,000 tons of her total weight was in her armor, a record that has never been equaled. Her largest guns were over 18 inches in diameter, and one single turret weighed more than a heavy destroyer. She carried 12 6-inch and 12 5-inch guns in her secondary battery and bristled with 152 25-millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Her watertight compartments and hundreds of design innovations made her the most glorious symbol of Japanese naval supremacy. But it would all be in vain. 6 April 1945. The battleship Yamato and nine support vessels steam out of the port of Kure into the East China Sea. She is completely armed, but carries only enough fuel for a one-way trip to Okinawa. Ceremonial sake and prayers are offered to the 2,500-man crew, for this is to be the ultimate kamikaze mission. Yamato is to be sacrificed as the Imperial Navy's face-saving in the final battle of the war. This most powerful battleship of all time is to be run aground, her great guns used as field artillery. At sea, the Americans are waiting. The suicide task force is spotted by a single Grumman Hellcat out 240 miles from his base aboard the carrier Essex. The first wave of planes is ordered into the air. There are nine American carriers in position. The battleship Yamato will feel the full fury of their bombs and torpedoes. Hell divers, Avengers, Hellcats, over 400 of them, even more planes than the Japanese had unleashed at Pearl Harbor. 
Yamato went down with 2,498 Japanese officers and men. The only record of her final moments are these primitive combat photographs. But one can imagine such horror by recalling the death of another invincible battleship, HMS Barham, when a motion picture camera was there. The mushroom cloud from the Yamato was said to rise so high in the air that it was visible from the Japanese mainland 50 miles away. Yamato had become the symbolic funeral pyre of the Empire of Japan. For 50 years, the battleship had been the world's ultimate weapon, national policy represented by the threat of her powerful guns. The road to two world wars began with the creation of the first modern battleship. Work began in 1905 on an entirely new generation of battleships called Dreadnought. HMS Dreadnought would be the heaviest, fastest warship afloat. Her firepower was concentrated in 10 12-inch guns. To protect her magazine, she was wrapped with armor plate 11 inches thick. Below her waterline, 18 watertight compartments made her unsinkable. She carried torpedoes and was the first major warship to run on steam turbines, her eight engines propelling her at an unprecedented 21.6 knots. Andrew Gordon is an authority on Dreadnought. Dreadnought laid down the gauntlet to every major naval power in the world. They had now either to build Dreadnoughts themselves or relinquish major power status. Dreadnought changed everything. In America, Japan, and Germany, new battleships already approved were rushed into construction. The word dreadnought became synonymous with the new and more powerful battleships. Amazingly, one of dreadnought's near contemporaries survives to this day. She is the battleship Texas, launched in 1912. Moored along the Gulf Coast near Houston, the Texas stands as a monument to the thousands of battleship sailors who served with her from 1914 through two world wars. The guns on the Texas were controlled by primitive computers. Armor plate on her sides was a full 12 inches thick. Each turret was manned by 24 sailors who lived and worked in dark, cramped quarters. The Texas reminds us of the primitive conditions aboard the first modern battleship. Steve Nelson is an historian and head curator of the Texas. What makes the USS Texas so similar to HMS Dreadnought are these big guns. Now these are 14 inch guns, the Dreadnought had 12 inch guns. And the way these guns worked was that two crew members had to man this loading ramp, drop that down into position, the 14 inch shell was rammed all the way up the breech, 400 pounds of powder was placed in behind the shell, the crew had to grab the ramp again, making sure that it breaks in the middle, closing up. The breach was closed. The crew had to jump into tight, confined spaces like this, buckle themselves in, and communicate with their crew members through this voice tube, ready to fire. Ironically, Dreadnought would never fire her great guns in anger. Yet, within the decade, her existence would propel the world into war. June 28, 1914, the Archduke of Austria and his wife are assassinated by anarchists. The world explodes into war. German submarines attack British merchant shipping. 
Then on May 30, 1916, the German fleet steams to sea for its first confrontation with England's Grand Fleet. The decade-long arms race approaches Armageddon. The dreadnoughts meet off the coast of the Danish peninsula called Jutland. 250 warships fight the greatest sea battle the world has ever seen. When it is over, 25 ships have been sunk, 8,465 men killed, over 1,000 wounded. John Samita is an historian and authority on the Battle of Jutland, as is Eric Grove. They are at Admiralty headquarters on London's Pall Mall. The problem to the people who sat in this room was that the battle had not succeeded in gaining the crucial objective, the destruction of the high sea fleet. The battle did succeed in proving that the dreadnoughts were vulnerable. The German reaction was to keep her battleships in port for the remainder of the war. The British had failed to win an overwhelming victory at Jutland because the success of their big guns at long distances in the smoke and haze was only two or three percent of hits to shots fired. The problem for the Royal Navy at the Battle of Jutland was her battle fleet was prepared before the war for a battle that was going to take place at a much lower ranges. The British were working on a system of firing battleship guns at very long ranges. It was based on the work of Arthur Hungerford Pollan, who created a primitive computer before the word computer had been invented. Pollan developed the idea of using very advanced range finders that were gyroscopically stabilized against the motion of his own ship, a very advanced analog computer, very advanced systems of transmitting the uh, calculations of that computer to the guns. The pollen system would have greatly improved accuracy, but was too expensive and was rejected by the Admiralty. They'd been informed by their intelligence that the Germans intended to fight at very short ranges. Their intelligence was dead wrong. This raised huge question marks over the whole way the British Royal Navy did its business. Admiral Beatty was in close contact with the Board of Admiralty who sat in this room. He said, there's something wrong with our bloody ships today and something wrong with our system. In the closing days of World War I in the Adriatic Sea, an Italian speedboat fires its torpedoes at two Austrian dreadnoughts. A combat cameraman aboard the Tagetov watches as two milky white tracks head for the St. Stephen. These pictures document the first sinking of a battleship by a simple torpedo exploding below her armor belt, where she was to prove as vulnerable as any other ship. The primitive camera grinds on as nearly 1,000 men are lost. Days later, the war is over. The Allies and their defeated foe gather to set the terms of peace at Versailles. And as Germany's captured high seas fleet makes its way through internment at the Scapaflow naval anchorage north of Scotland, a secret plan to seal its fate is already in place. On the morning of June 21, 1919, German sailors aboard their captured ships carry out their orders scuttling 51 vessels, including their prized battleships, rather than hand them over to England as prizes of war. Their rotting remains still litter the bottom of Scapa Flow. As the new decade gets underway, disarmament is the mood of the day. The worldwide focus of attention is on the battleship that single most expensive symbol of a nation's military strength. The cry for the destruction of these major weapons and the distribution of the peace dividend into social programs is not unlike the mood that swept America after the Cold War. In the spring of 1921, Brigadier General of the Army Billy Mitchell learns the Navy is preparing to bomb the captured German battleship Ostfriesland 
as part of its ongoing tests of air power versus sea power. For Mitchell, air power is an idea whose time has come. He fervently believes that the airplane will make armies and navies obsolete. July 19, 1921 is an auspicious day. Billy Mitchell has gathered 50 correspondents and 300 dignitaries to observe the events as a military band begins the festivities at Virginia's Langley Field. The crowd watches throughout the day. Mitchell's pilots drop bomb after bomb, but damage is minimal. The next day, Mitchell's Martin bombers are equipped with 2,000-pound ship killer bombs. They are the biggest bombs in the world. Today, they will find their mark. Some are set to explode 30 feet beneath the surface of the water, as if multiple torpedoes are striking the ship from below, where she carries no protective armor. Finally, the Ausfriesland slips beneath the waters of the Chesapeake just 21 minutes after the day's work began. Air power has met the battleship head on, and it's been a bad day for the Navy. And so, in the fall of 1921, with Mitchell's triumph as prologue, the international disarmament conferences begin in Washington. When the meetings are over, guns on all existing warships are limited to 14 inches and displacement to 35,000 tons. No new battleships are to be built for 10 years. Others must be destroyed. France is given equality in tonnage with Italy, as is Britain with the United States. Germany is to be kept inferior to everyone, including the Japanese, who are angered when they are forced to accept a battleship strength well below Britain and America. Some will later say, on the day the conference ended, World War II began. Soon, Japan and Germany would embark upon the path of rearmament and conquest. Within two decades, the world will once again be at war. And once again, the battleship will play a major part. It is 1939. Adolf Hitler has overrun Eastern Europe. And at sea, German U-boats once again prey on Britain's merchant fleet. Nazi surface raiders capture crews, then sink their ships. One such raider is the German battleship Admiral Graf Spee. Her captain, Hans Langsdorff, is a veteran of the First World War. He is known for his humane leadership. In the past year, he has destroyed nine merchant ships without the loss of a single life. I think he had a real sense of responsibility for his ship's company. And he felt that decisions he had taken himself to risk the ship and risk them should not lead his men uh, into very dangerous situations. Now in the closing weeks of 1939, Hitler dispatches Langsdorf to intercept British cargo vessels off the coast of Uruguay. He was going to the River Plate to find a convoy a convoy that he would sink together with the escort. And he had been given the strictest of orders that the last thing a German raider should do was engage British warships. But for some unknown reason, Langsdorf disobeys. Perhaps he thinks any British warships in the area will be small and easily sunk. Aboard the British cruiser Ajax, Commodore Henry Harwood has been hunting the Graf Spee for months. Now he guesses exactly where Langsdorff is heading. And with the two other cruisers under his command, HMS Exeter and Achilles, he steams to intercept. On the Graf Spee, Langsdorff sights the masts of Exeter, thinks she is alone, and opens fire. The Battle of the River Plate has begun. The Graf Spee's gunnery is superb. Exeter is hit first, then Ajax. 
Still, Harwood manages to direct the Ajax's guns on the Graf Spee. Exeter fires her torpedoes. The Germans must turn hard to avoid them and thereby leave the field of battle. Langsdorf orders the Graf Spee to the neutral harbor at Montevideo. He pleads for time to make repairs, but the Uruguayan authorities refuse. The ship is badly damaged, and her captain has received two head wounds. The Graf Spee must leave in 72 hours. Langsdorf radios Berlin for instructions. At 5.25 on Sunday afternoon, 17 December 1939, this wounded symbol of Hitler's navy weighs anchor and heads to sea. Outside the harbor, the British warships wait. A huge crowd has assembled to watch the battle to come. But there will be no battle. Just beyond the three-mile limit, the battleship turns west and anchors. Captain Langsdorf and his officers depart the ship to find safe haven in Buenos Aires. Shortly afterward, explosions rack the Graf Spee. Two days later, alone in his hotel room, Langsdorf commits suicide. He was found lying on the German ensign, the ensign of the ship, perhaps trying to atone with his own sacrifice for the disaster he had brought upon the German Navy. July 1940, in London, Prime Minister Winston Churchill confronts a new crisis. France has fallen to the Nazis. The fate of her navy is yet to be determined. France had a first-class navy, and if it had fallen into German hands, then British security would have been threatened, American security would have been threatened, and the whole naval situation would have been transformed. The neutralization of the French fleet was a necessary condition for the survival of the United Kingdom. Churchill forbids French ships and British ports to put to sea. He dispatches a powerful squadron of warships to confront what remains of the French force in the Mediterranean at a place called Mirs el Kabir, Algeria. It is an impressive show of British sea power. Two 35,000-ton battleships, the carrier Ark Royal, and leading the squadron, Britain's ultimate symbol of naval supremacy, the battle cruiser HMS Hood. At 42,000 tons with eight 15-inch guns, the Hood is considered the most powerful warship in the world. At 32 knots, she is also among the fastest. HMS Hood is the embodiment of British sea power, an imperial status symbol. Aboard the Hood, in command of the British Strike Force, is Vice Admiral James Somerville. He anchors his flotilla at Gibraltar and prepares to send his emissary, Cedric Holland, to reason with the French Admiral, Marcel Gensoul. In a final briefing to his officers aboard the Hood, Somerville is grave. I am ordered to inform the French. They must either bring their ships to British harbors and fight with us, steam with reduced crews to a British port and demilitarize their ships immediately or scuttle them. Should the French be unwilling, we must then destroy the French ships. For two days, Holland travels back and forth between Gensoul and Somerville. The Admiral is immovable. If he accepts any of the British options, he will betray his word to the Germans and France will be punished. And so shortly after noon on July 3, 1940, the Hood trains her guns on the port of Mirs el Kabir, where four French battleships and a collection of auxiliary vessels lie defiantly at anchor. France and England have not fired a shot at each other in 125 years. The British battleships open fire. In just 10 minutes, three French battleships and a destroyer are out of commission. Churchill has called it the deadly stroke. When it is over, 1,290 men of the French Navy are dead. 1,000 more have been wounded. 
The French Admiral presides over the mass burial. He says, if there is a stain on the flag, it is certainly not on ours. Aboard the hood, Admiral Somerville writes to his wife, we all feel thoroughly dirty and ashamed. I think it was the biggest political blunder of modern times. The action of the British squadron that summer of 1940 remains a controversy, but at the time, the symbolism was clear. Churchill was determined to demonstrate to the United States that Britain was serious about staying in the war. Britain was not going to do a France, and therefore Britain was worthy of American support. Control of the Mediterranean was an essential element of the British war plan in 1940. On 11 November, just four months after the attack on Mirs el Kabir, the British carrier Illustrious maneuvers into position. For the first time in naval history, the British will attempt a surprise attack by carrier-based aircraft against an enemy naval base. Their target, the Italian port of Toronto. Their bombs and torpedoes wreak havoc on the ships of Mussolini's fleet. John Neal of the Fleet Air Arm was in the first wave of planes. We were absolutely cock we really were, because we, we saw at once that we had reduced the Italian fleet to on a par, or perhaps even less than our own fleet. So no longer were there really any immediate danger to us in the Mediterranean. We also felt that we had put one in the eye of the battleship boys, shall I call them, or the big ship gunners, who in effect ruled the Navy in those days. Word of the mission's unqualified success catches the attention of the top-ranking officer in the United States Navy, Admiral Harold Stark. He is concerned that what happened to the Italian fleet at Toronto could easily happen to the American fleet secluded in Pearl Harbor. Admiral Stark sounds the alarm, which goes largely unheeded in Washington. But not in Tokyo. On hearing the news from Toronto, the commander-in-chief of Japan's combined fleet, Admiral Yamamoto turns to his chief of staff and says, an air attack on Pearl Harbor might be possible now, especially as our air training has turned out so successfully. Spring 1941, the Japanese continue their aggression in Indochina and sign a war pact with Germany. Most of Europe is under the Nazi boot. Hitler is pleased with his new Japanese ally as he presides over the launch of Germany's newest, most formidable weapon, the battleship Bismarck. The ship is referred to as he, in deference both to its namesake, the great Prussian chancellor, and the masculine warrior tasks for which it was created. On one speed trial in the Baltic, he reaches 30.8 knots. The ship boasts eight 15-inch guns and a sophisticated fire control system. Bismarck's armor consumes 40% of the ship's weight. The battleship is the perfect symbol for the Third Reich. And yet, Bismarck is far too valuable to place in harm's way. Its mission is to hunt enemy merchant ships, as do the other German raiders. On May 19, 1941, Bismarck steams to sea on its maiden voyage. Even before Hitler learns of its departure, the British are tracking Bismarck's progress. Four days later, the battleship is located by the superior radar of the heavy cruiser Suffolk. Now the Royal Navy knows Bismarck is on the move, racing for the North Atlantic. HMS Hood and Prince of Wales are dispatched to intercept. By 5.45 on the morning of 24 May, the Hood and Prince of Wales have closed within 13 miles of Bismarck. Hood fires first. Bismarck immediately returns fire. The first shells strike the Hood's fused torpedoes at midships and she explodes. The battle was over in a matter of minutes. Hood blew in two, a huge explosion, witnessed in horror from Prince of Wales. 
A hood's going at 28 knots, the stern section virtually drove herself into the sea, and the bow section canted up. A final salvo was seen being fired from the foremost guns uselessly into the sky. In, in a few seconds, Hood was gone. Of the ship's total company of 1,419, three survivors cling to life rafts in the icy water. Only one, Sigelman Ted Briggs, is alive today. I felt myself being dragged down, and I was trying to get away. And the next thing I knew was I suddenly seemed, just seemed to shoot to the surface. When I came up, there wasn't another soul inside. I looked around, and she was about 50 yards away, and she was vertical with the water. And the bee turret was just going under. I panicked, and I turned and swam as fast as I could away from her. And when I looked around again, she'd gone. Those on the upper deck, a lot were killed and wounded before she, before she went. And the others, I suppose, were just taken care of by, by suction. But only three of us came up. She was a beautiful, proud ship, but unfortunately, with a glass jaw. HMS Hood's glass jaw was a function of her design, armor had been sacrificed for speed. The next day, the victorious Bismarck, a hole in its bow from a shell fired from Prince of Wales, is short on fuel and heads directly for France. The Royal Navy had been utterly shocked at the loss of Hood. Ships right across the Atlantic converged towards the likely area of Bismarck, in some cases without orders. They had to find Bismarck. They were going to sink that ship, one way or another. 26 May, 1941, 10.30 a.m. A Catalina flying boat dives through the clouds for a better look at a huge ship below. It is met with a hail of gunfire from the Bismarck, trailing oil at 20 knots, less than 12 hours from freedom in France. But only 50 miles away is the British carrier Ark Royal. Within minutes, 15 of the Ark Royal's swordfish are in the air. Most of their torpedoes will miss, but one jams the Bismarck's rudder and plants the seeds of its destruction. Royal Navy battleships will finish the job. Bismarck died under very severe bombardment, was shot to pieces at close range. It was very bloody, and nearly 2,000 men died. It was a human tragedy. A very stout ship, slow death, hammered to pieces. In less than half an hour, the greatest German warship of all time rolls over and sinks. The victim of 400 shells, 15 well-placed torpedoes, and British resolve to revenge the hood. By the fall of 1945, after more than six years of the fiercest fighting the world has ever seen, all of Germany's battleships have been sunk, and Japan's monster battleship, her last hope for victory, is also at the bottom of the sea. World War II is over. The once mighty empire of Japan lies in ruin. President Harry Truman from Missouri prepares for peace. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government. In he has determined that the unconditional surrender of Japan will take place most symbolically upon the deck of the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The Americans have come back to Japan to anchor very near the spot where in 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry anchored to demand that the Japanese open their nation to the West. The events of the day will be carefully documented. 170 reporters, photographers, and radio sound men swarm the decks of the USS Missouri to record sounds and images that will be seen around the world for years to come. To this day, the battleship Missouri remains the most historic of all American battleships. For naval historian and battleship veteran Paul Stilwell, the Missouri 
is an heroic symbol, for on her deck, one era ended and another began. And so it was on September 2nd, 1945, that General Douglas MacArthur came to this ladder at 9.01 on that Sunday morning while the Japanese were waiting for him to come down and accept the surrender of a proud but defeated nation. As the general walked forward, on his left was an American flag flown out from Annapolis for the ceremony. It had been on board Commodore Matthew Perry's flagship in Tokyo Bay in 1853. Farther to the left were dozens of American officers wearing khaki. The Japanese ahead of him were in top hats and morning coats. The Japanese looked up to this towering superstructure and saw hundreds of pairs of eyes boring down at them. There was an eerie silence on board the deck of the Missouri as General MacArthur came to the end of his walk. Standing just about here, his hand trembling slightly at 9.02, he began a short speech looking beyond the war. We are gathered here to conclude a solemn agreement. At 9.04, Foreign Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu signed on behalf of the Japanese nation. Then the military representative. Then General MacArthur signed for the Allied powers. Finally, one by one, the representatives of the Allies came forward whereby these proceedings are closed. And so, on board a battleship, ended the greatest war in human history. Today, the Missouri remains the pinnacle of battleship design and technology. Still ready, it would seem, for another fight or yet another symbolic mission. On that infamous Sunday morning in 1941, Japan had sought to destroy every one of America's battleships in a single stroke. Yet here on the deck of a battleship, they surrendered without condition to the overwhelming force of the United States and her allies. The living symbol of that force remains the battleship Missouri. Missouri Captain Lee Case. She is a ship with a heart and soul. And the soul of the ship has always been and always will be the past, present, and future sailors that serve on her. In peace and war, the tradition of the American battleship sailor grew large, enhanced by competition of every kind. They were like rival schools cheering on their own. Battleship sailors have long been a special breed, perhaps because of the extraordinary teamwork required to man the guns and fight the ship, or the special symbolic nature of a battleship, or simply because they knew they were aboard the Navy's best. Their ship became their home, and their home was a matter of pride. Between 1920 and 1941, America's fleet included up to 18 battleships that cruised the oceans of the world to train their crews and fly the flag, a powerful symbol that the American Navy was a genuine deterrent to any would-be aggressor. And among those pre-war American battleships was the USS North Carolina. Today, she rests as a state memorial in Wilmington, honoring the more than 10,000 North Carolinians who fought and died in World War II. Welcome to the USS North Carolina. A visit aboard the North Carolina is a visit back in time. And as you begin it, let us tell you something about this giant of a ship. We should start by saying there have been three. Here, some 2,500 men once lived and worked and carried on the business of war in a city at sea.
The North Carolina's engines could drive the ship at 27 knots, six knots faster than any previous American battleship. Here rest the nine great guns of her main battery, fired 2,396 times in nine operations by crews that often worked around the clock in the suffocating heat of the Pacific. Captain Dave Shoy is executive director of the North Carolina Memorial. He explains how the crew worked the guns. This is the lower projectile flat from where the crew would take the chosen type of ammunition, be it the 2,700-pound armor piercing or the 1,900-pound high-capacity projectile, and raise it up to the gun house to be placed in the barrel. Each steel barrel weighs 96 tons and can be loaded in 30 seconds. The first projectile is already in place to be raised up to the gun house. Once this projectile is clear, the next projectile is slid into place. A full nine-gun broadside of armor-piercing projectiles delivers a total weight of 24,000 pounds and can penetrate more than 20 inches of the strongest hardened steel. For every projectile, it takes six 90-pound powder bags. The crews down here will take the bags out of the tanks, put them on the conveyor belt. From here, they're passed one at a time to the powder flat, and then six of them together are gonna be raised up to the gun. The projectile, when the transfer tray lays down, is then rammed into the barrel. In the second phase, the first three bags of powder come out of the hoist and are separated, and then the second three bags are rolled into place. In the third phase, the six bags of powder would then be rammed into the barrel, the primer attached to the last powder bag, the breech closed, and the gun is ready to fire. The shells are hurtled over 2,000 feet per second as the gun recoils on itself, a distance of four feet. At a range of nearly 20 miles with the guns at maximum elevation, the trajectory is seven miles high and the projectile becomes an armor-piercing bomb. To hit a moving target from a ship which itself is moving, pitching, and rolling requires a complex system of fire control. Deep below deck is the North Carolina's plotting room and the ship's analog computers. These primitive yet rugged computers called range keepers and their electrical switchboards control the guns. A stream of information from directors high up in the superstructure is relayed into the controlling range keeper. The course and speed of the ship and of its target ship, wind direction and velocity, temperature of the powder in the air, type of projectile, time of flight, gun wear, velocity of the ocean current and more. The gun is aimed not at the target, but where the target will be when the projectile gets there. Linked to the controlling range keeper is a gyroscopically operated device called the stable vertical. The guns actually remain stable and can be aimed with great accuracy while the ship rolls and pitches beneath them. The five inch guns were controlled by the same kind of computers or range keepers as the 16 inch guns, but loading was a manual operation. Dave Shoy. The five inch gun uses a projectile and a single powder case as opposed to the 16 inch gun which uses a projectile and six powder bags. So it is simpler for the, the operators to load the mount. They will you lay the projectile and the powder bag in the tray and then ram the uh, two pieces into the barrel. It takes about 47 sailors to fully man a five inch mount. Today, visitors relive what it was like to serve aboard such a ship. In passageways and living spaces below the main deck, thousands of battleship sailors made their home in ships like the North Carolina. They slept and ate and worked and played and worked.
the galley served up three meals a day and then some. There was a store and a post office. And on a battleship, there was ice cream at the soda fountain. There was a newspaper, a tailor, and a cobbler. And always there were decks to polish. As night falls, the North Carolina looms large against the Wilmington skyline. Her great guns glow in the moonlight as she awaits yet another day to welcome her visitors. Eager to know what it was once like aboard one of America's most decorated battleships. Although the North Carolina came home to stay, others would soon return to the battle line in defense of freedom. Sunday, 25 June 1950, six divisions of the North Korean Army, spearheaded by over 100 Soviet built tanks, crossed the 38th parallel to invade South Korea. The United States, through the United Nations, is committed to defend South Korea. But what remains of America's once great battleships rests in mothballs. Only the Missouri, the last battleship commissioned by the United States Navy, is still at sea. Among her peaceful and symbolic missions, the Missouri traveled to South America and brought President Harry Truman home from an international conference in Rio de Janeiro in 1947. He and his family enjoyed life aboard the historic warship. He mixed with the crew, took walks, and actually waited in line at the barber shop. He admitted to being a first-time crosser of the equator and accepted his initiation as a polywog in high spirits. From 1948 to 1950, the world's most famous battleship was at sea as a training ship. When North Korean troops marched into South Korea, she was quickly ordered back to Norfolk to be loaded with supplies and live ammunition. The Missouri would be going back to work as a battleship. In time, she would be joined by her three sisters of the Iowa class, the Iowa, Wisconsin, and New Jersey, all four reactivated from mothballs for wartime duties to protect the fast carriers and bombard North Korean positions ashore. September 1950, the battleship Missouri has fought through two hurricanes, arriving too late for support of the American invasion at Incheon. Now, equipped with a helicopter for spotting, her big guns speak once again. Just before Christmas 1950, the Communist Chinese came into the war on the side of the North Koreans. Seven Chinese divisions converged on a single division of American Marines at Chosin Reservoir. The Marines fought their way to the tiny port city of Hungnam. The Missouri was there. Lee Royal was aboard. We fired night and day. It was a warning to the Chinese and North Koreans not to interfere with the Marines coming off the beach. Hungnam was in flames. The American Marines, along with North Korean civilians, their goats and chickens, had escaped. The last of the UN soldiers had set charges in the ammunition dump to keep it from the approaching Chinese. As the Missouri weighed anchor to leave the harbor, the earth shook with a gigantic explosion. While the Missouri was steaming in Korean waters, her sister ship, the New Jersey, was being recommissioned. By May, she was stationed off the North Korean port city of Kansong. At five in the morning of May 20, the guns of the New Jersey were fired in anger for the first time since 1945. 
After six months of operations off the coast of Korea, the New Jersey is relieved by her sister ship, the Wisconsin. And for six months in 1952, by the Iowa. Before the war is over, all four Iowa-class battleships will have seen action in Korean waters. After Korea, there were diplomatic cruises, training missions, and NATO maneuvers. But in November 1957, the Wisconsin completed her final cruise and followed her three Iowa-class sisters into the mothball fleet. For the first time since the 1890s, the United States was without even one active battleship. Throughout the first half of the politically charged 1960s, America became increasingly involved in a war in Southeast Asia. Perhaps a battleship could save American lives. But the battleships of the Iowa class slept in mothballs. Then, in 1967, the word came down, bring back the New Jersey. Within months, she would be guided into dry dock at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, where her great hull would leave the water for the first time in a decade. The men of the shipyard had done this job before, some of them when she was first built in the early 1940s. From scaffolding high in the superstructure and in spaces below, the men of the Philadelphia Yard would bring the ship back to life, updating her electronics for the Navy of the 1960s. Finally, after nearly a year of work, the reborn New Jersey steams triumphantly to sea. On September 29, 1968, the world's only active battleship arrived off the coast of Da Nang, South Vietnam, ready for work. Ready. Captain of the New Jersey at the time was the colorful J. Edward Snyder. The commanding officer of the field hospital said that he was taking incoming, incoming means that the North Vietnamese were shelling his hospital while they were trying to do operations. And would I consider putting a, lobbing a shell over his hospital uh, just for the heck of it to try to see if that would stop them? And I said, well, I'd be perfectly willing to do that. Uh, let me take a look at what the situation is. And uh, of course, one of my officers said, you can't fire over your own troops. And I said, they're not troops, they're the hospital. He said, well, that's worse. I said, oh, shut up, we're gonna do it anyhow. So we would stand up there and between the hours of one o'clock and three o'clock in the morning, fire randomly two shells directly over the hospital and have the explosion go several thousand yards over the hospital. And uh, not one time during the 30 days we did that did the hospital take incoming from the Vietnamese. Throughout her tour in Vietnam, the New Jersey was the constant object of attention from the press. On one occasion, a reporter approached Captain Snyder and asked about the ship's real effectiveness. I said to him, well, why don't you ask the people we're supporting, for heaven's sakes? They're the people that know whether I'm effective or not or whether the ship's effective. So he goes ashore, he comes back, and he shows it to me. He plays me the tape, and the last line of the tape was, if it hadn't been for the Big J, they would have zapped our ass. By June of 1969, the New Jersey was back home in friendly waters. And only six months later, on a damp and chilly day in Bremerton, Washington, an old story was being repeated once again. For the second time, the New Jersey had been consigned to the mothball fleet. Her new captain, Robert Penniston, voiced the feelings of many when he said, the hour cometh, and now is to say farewell. Rest well, yet sleep lightly, and hear the call. Then in the fall of 1979, Iranian militants seized America's embassy in Tehran. The Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and the United States was perceived by some as weak, unwilling, or unable to act. But by 1981, America had a new president, and Ronald Reagan's Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, had new ideas to build an enlarged fleet organized around aircraft carriers and recommissioned Iowa-class battleships. By summer, President Reagan had signed the new defense legislation, and all four of the Iowa-class ships were on their way back. They would be transformed 
modernized with the very latest of weaponry. No longer would their offensive action be limited to the range of their historic 16-inch guns. Eight box launchers for 32 Tomahawk cruise missiles with a range of 1,500 miles and four quadruple canister launchers for 16 close-in harpoon anti-ship missiles were mounted in the superstructures. Four Vulcan phalanx weapon systems would provide defense against enemy aircraft and incoming missiles. New communication systems, air search radar, and improved living spaces equipped the Iowas for the 1980s. To replace and refit what was required of the original equipment, no longer manufactured, the Navy secured tons of items from America's museum battleships, the North Carolina, Alabama, and Massachusetts. The 1982 recommissioning of the New Jersey cost $326 million, more than three times what it cost a builder in 1941. But to Secretary Lehman, intent on creating a new Navy, symbolic of America's status as a world power, she was more than worth it. By 1983, the New Jersey is bright and new once again. She cruises as the centerpiece of a new battle group. She is part of a peacekeeping force off the coast of Lebanon. For six months, she cruises the coast and shells Syrian gun positions ashore. In time, she is joined at sea by the USS Iowa and her sister ships, Missouri and Wisconsin. Ralston, what do you have on uh, Skunk about uh, five degrees off the uh, port bow? Yes, sir. It's uh, Skunk India, bearing 255-21,000, uh, course 075. Evaluator, I have an update on the Kenda. Very well. All stations report ready for call for fire. All stations report and ready to call for fire. Report ready to call for fire. On a routine training mission in the spring of 1989, as the crew of the Iowa prepares to fire the center 16-inch gun in number two turret, something goes terribly wrong. 47 sailors are killed in a tragedy that to this day has not been fully explained. And as the Cold War comes to an end the next year, the Iowa and her sister, the New Jersey, are again to be decommissioned. Only the Wisconsin and Missouri continue to cruise and train with the modern Navy, flying the flag, awaiting the day when they too will be returned to mothballs, sold as scrap, or converted as museums. No one yet realized that America's two remaining battleships would soon fight their third war. Perhaps their final war. In Operation Desert Storm, the battleship was once again an integral part of the American strike force. From their decks, Tomahawk cruise missiles were launched at targets up to 800 miles away in Iraq and Kuwait. They were so accurate and destructive that eventually the coalition ran out of targets. No hostile fire ever reached the battleships. The relentless bombardment from their 16-inch guns helped pave the way as the troops of the coalition entered Kuwait City unopposed. And all the while, the battleship sailors aboard their ships watched their success, as did the rest of the world. The forces of the coalition declared victory on February 28th. During the final days of the land war, the men of the Missouri had performed for four straight days without sleep in the best tradition of the battleship sailor. Lee Case. Sailors on other ships are always watching sailors on battleships. They're trying to emulate them. They would like to be there in their place. They know that they're in a position where they're always on display. And the sailors on board a battleship have to carry out the task that they're assigned to do, but they have to do them better than the rest of the fleet. And therefore, they're always six inches taller than the rest of them. On the 6th of March, the Wisconsin departs the Persian Gulf. The Missouri heads for home on the 21st. 
They will sail into a post-Cold War world of military downsizing and critics who still remember the tragic explosion aboard the Iowa. By September, the Wisconsin has been decommissioned and the Missouri's days are growing shorter. But she will make one last symbolic and ceremonial voyage. She is going back to observe the anniversary of the event that plunged America into World War II. Paul Stilwell. One morning in early December 1991, it was my privilege to be here on board the battleship Missouri as she steamed in the Pearl Harbor Channel for the last time. As we went in on the port side were the mooring caves where the battleships had been in December 1941 when the Japanese attacked. And in my mind's eye, I could see the smoke and the flame billowing up where hundreds of American sailors were killed. The past and present intertwine in the memories of young and old. 50 years ago to the day, their thoughts float back to that Sunday morning when many thought the era of the battleship had come to an end. For the Missouri, symbol of all the great battleships of the Second World War, it has been a journey back in time. The next chapter in her long life can now begin. March 31, 1992, the Long Beach Naval Shipyard. Her equipment inactivated, her compartment stripped of every usable item. The world's last active battleship is to be decommissioned. Now she seems but a symbol of past glories, the last of her breed of thoroughbreds. For a hundred years, they changed the world into which they had been born. Dreadnought began an arms race that never seemed to cease. To this day, major powers still seek the ultimate weapon. For the first 50 years of its life, the battleship was that weapon, the nuclear weapon of her day. Now, one by one, America's last battleships have been retired, fitting memorials to the thousands who died in war. Texas, Massachusetts, Alabama, North Carolina. And now the Missouri is in receipt of her final orders, her guns silenced, her system shut down, she will pass from history into legend and take her place moored near the battleship Arizona as a memorial in Pearl Harbor. Two great warships that mark the beginning and the end of the greatest conflict in human history. <laughs>